Okay, greetings. This is week two, and we're going to be focusing on the hypothalamus. Now, you should be looking into chapter two. But chapter two gathers both the hypothalamus and, to a degree, the pituitary. I have chosen to separate these out because of the importance of each one of these to the general physiological function of the uh, organism. You will find that the hypothalamus is critical in controlling a lot of functions of not only the pituitary and its uh, endocrine secretions, but also um, it plays a key role in the function of a variety of other mechanisms that occur in the body and in the brain. Um, it used to be thought that the pituitary was the master gland that kind of influenced all these other endocrine glands and they would then affect the body. And since work in the mid 1960s and such, that's changed. And it, the master gland really is the hypothalamus. But let's get into some detail here and we'll find out more. Now, first off, if you see where this is, um, you're going to notice that the uh, hypothalamus is inferior or below, beneath the thalamus. The thalamus, if you remember, is a switching station in a way that sends sensory information to the various lobes of the brain for processing of that information, whether it's hearing to the temporal, visual to the uh, uh, occipital, or uh, to some of the other sections, the parietal for some kind of sensory information. But when you come to the hypothalamus, there's a bunch of interesting things. Just as a refresher, if you look at the brain, you'll notice that it's kind of covered with this grayish coloring material. And then on the inside is white matter. We call the gray material, the gray matter. Gray matter is made up of unmyelinated cells and cell um, cell bodies. But when you get inside of the brain, the white matter is all heavily myelinated uh, axons that interconnect information to be processed through various parts of the brain. But even in white matter, you're going to have these little clusters or darker areas, these nuclei that are unmyelinated, but they themselves process and do certain uh, unique functions, whether it's to secrete something or control certain aspects of uh, movement or body function, etc. When you get to the hypothalamus, you're going to find this is a bunch of different nuclei, and we're going to talk about those. Some of them will release a hormone, and it will travel down these unmyelinated uh, axons and be released out here into this small cluster of capillaries at the posterior part of the pituitary. Others will release a hormone and it will first be picked up by this primary capillary plexus and then travel down these hypophyseal veins where it will be released in this secondary capillary plexus here to influence these cells to release hormones. Now, of course, this is the anterior part of the pituitary. This is the posterior part. We're going to take one week on each one of those. What you're also going to notice is that this is this entire structure, this hypothalamus. Not only is it filled with different nuclei that do different things, but it is also right next to the optic chiasm where visual input is spread and sequestered. Uh, and heading off to the occipital lobes. You will also notice that there is a blood supply that runs through here, and we're going to monitor how certain substances like uh, osmolarity and other substances are processed, and they may be the stimulus for certain secretion. There are two hormones that are made in specific nuclei here, that eventually get released out here. And that's going to be oxytocin and ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone, otherwise known as vasopressin. 
the other hormones are going to pass through this uh, portal system and go through and down into here to act on the release of a variety of other pituitary hormones. This structure here, this small stalk-like structure, is called the infundibulum. All right. And what we're going to see is how important this relationship is, just to give you a pointer. I remember seeing this a while back. There was a gentleman who was in a very severe uh, car accident with uh, his head. Uh, basically, I believe it hit either the dash or something like that. But it left a basically a tearing away of somewhat uh, the infundibulum. Therefore, the communication and the hormones that control uh, the release of certain hormones down in the anterior pituitary were not able to transport down through this system. Now, one thing to help you here, there is an incredibly small amount of hormone that is produced here that travels down this very short uh, portal pathway and then gets released here. So in other words, you don't need a lot of this hormone. As a matter of fact, it's in incredibly small amounts. But because it's like that, if an injury wreck delivery system, the small amounts that are being released will basically, uh, through other, basically the systemic circulation, they'll be diluted down where they're basically useless. What doctors eventually did was they developed a type of small drug pump that would release, and in this case, the gentleman had complained because he had lost his libido, and so they had developed gonadotropin, releasing hormone, and put it into a drug pump, and he had a permanent little small uh, bore needle put into his side, and after he'd gotten used to how to care for this, etc., he went home and he said, you know what? By the time I by the time I was home, I started feeling like, hmm, I want to have marital relations with my wife. And as a matter of fact, a year after that uh, report occurred, they had a little boy. And so it's not merely just being able to deliver the hormones and have them go in the blood. It is the dilution or the concentration necessary to stimulate the next target organ, which is what I want you to get. A mind flow. The second thing, of course, is that this is all part of what we call the hypothalamic pituitary axis. But let's go into this a little bit more. When you look at the functions of the hypothalamus, this includes food intake, energy expenditure, sleep-wake cycle, body weight. Now, I'll just stop here for a second. I remember in the 80s, uh, there were some scientists, and at that time, they didn't have knockout genes or any other type of specialized um, trials to ask questions like, what would happen if this was turned off or this was turned off? So what they would do is they would take a rat and they would ablate, using a small electric wire, a section of the hypothalamus. They wanted to see what that controlled. And the rats would recover, and they would compare normal rats to these rats that were treated. And it was an incredible photo you would see is this huge, huge overweight, uh, just literally spilling over the, the sides rat that had no control on its food intake, thereby it had no control of energy expenditure or body weight as compared to a normal rat, which was far less heavy, okay? By just destroying that section of that tiny little area of the brain, they had basically destroyed the capability of the animal at the hypothalamic region to control food intake and body weight. Okay. Now, over time, we're going to go over this also because there are some aspects of fluid intake and balance, blood pressure, thirst. Body temperature is also controlled by the hypothalamus as well as aspects of the autonomic nervous system. Now, most hypothalamic responses, though, are mediated through the hypothalamic control of the pituitary function. Keep that in mind. So let's take a look at some of this. When we talk about 
hypothalamic responses. They're mediated through the hypothalamic control of the pituitary function. Okay, There's the basic con uh, control mechanisms of one, release of the hypothalamic neuropeptides that are synthesized in the hypothalamic neurons. They are transported via this hypothalamic hypothecial tract unmyelinated um, axons that follow down from the hypothalamus and eventually end, have their terminal endings in the posterior pituitary, where they send into the blood either oxytocin or vasopressin. Now, in neuroendocrine control of the anterior pituitary, that's a little bit different. Uh, that's going to be through the release of peptides. This is the hypo physiotrophic hormones that control the anterior pituitary release. What I mean by that is this is where you're going to get into what the hypothalamus releases in the sense of what they call releasing hormones. They're all going to end with RH, okay, for releasing hormone. Now, the hypothalamus is part of the diencephalon. This is the structure of the brain. It's located uh, inferior to the uh, thalamus. And it's between the lamina terminalis and the mammary body, bodies, which form the walls and floor of the third ventricle. The two halves of the hypothalamus are joined by a region called the median eminence. The median eminence is where axon terminals of the hypothalamic hormones are released to control the anterior pituitary. Also, the hypothalamic axons ending in the posterior pituitary cross over the median eminence. The median eminence, think of it as sort of like a funnel. It funnels downward to form the infundibular stalk. We also call it the infundibulum or the infundibular portion of the neural hypophyses. Now, this is a good picture. And the reason why I like this is because it shows you really the hypothalamus with all of its various nuclei. Here's the parvoventricular nucleus. You have also, of course, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the superoptic nucleus, the anterior hypothalamic nucleus, the preoptic nucleus. You've got the mammillary body, which is also a nuclei of the hypothalamus. And you can see the posterior hypothalamic nucleus, the lateral hypothalamic area. It's more of a not as much a nuclei, but a, a sort of a, a sheet-like structure. The ventromedial nucleus is right here. Now, still, keep in mind something here. Oh, and don't forget also the arcuate nucleus right here. That this is all going to get funneled down into this little stalk here, the infundibulum, okay? Now, also, you can take a look at this mid-sagittal cut right here. And what you have is, of course, the third ventricle. At the bottom of it is the arcuate nucleus. And then below that, inferior to that, is the median eminence. You have the ventromedial hypothalamic nucleus here. The lateral hypothalamic nucleus here. Okay? On this side here, you have the periventricular nucleus, the dorsal medial hypothalamic nucleus here. Okay. You have the super optic nuclei here. And of course, the optic tract. Okay. But if you prefer and you want to look at the side view here, this is probably a good one also to get down. And that eventually the infundibulum the posterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary. Histologically, we'll get into this later, but when you look at a cut slide of the pituitary, anterior appears more glandular, posterior appears more neuronal, okay? Here's the optic chiasm. You can see some of the optic nerve coming in here to be having the image split in half. And you have the mam mammillary body here. The ventromedial nuclei, the posterior hypothalamic nuclei, uh, you're going to have also the anterior hypothalamic nuclei, the preoptic nucleus, the paraventricular nucleus. Okay? Now, you do need to get these down. 
So one of the tools to help you is page 30 in your text, table 2.2-1, uh, for key aspects of the hypothalamic hormones and the predominant hypothalamic nuclei that secrete them. Let's talk a little bit more about the hypothalamus as it relates to um, the autonomic nervous system. Now, when you look at the autonomic nervous system, it's subdivided into sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous systems. Okay, if you remember, uh, sympathetic is the fight or flight aspect. Uh, you have an increase in blood flow to lungs, heart, skeletal muscles certain physiological changes that occur in other parts of the body, but a shunting away of blood for the digestive system. The um, parasympathetic is rest and digest. And that's where blood is going to be shunted over uh, for the process of digesting food, also defecation, diuresis, things like that. And so you have this back and forth that goes on. Now, the posterior hypothalamus will really control the sympathetic nervous system. The anterior controls the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, of course, these hypothalamic centers exert their effects via the motor centers of the brainstem and the subspinal cord. So here are some of the motor centers here, such as we're talking about for uh, things like respiration, blood pressure, uh, secondary respiration, urinary bladder control, etc. Okay. Now, also, you want to keep in mind that the hypothalamic center centers are also influenced by impulses from the cerebral cortex out here. Okay. And the limbic system. Okay. So through here. It's nice to see also if you take a peek up here you see certain nuclei marked off for eating behavior, water balance, and temperature control. Okay, we'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. Now, there's two major types of uh, cells that you're going to find in uh, different nuclei. Um, the ones that you're going to be dealing with, you need to know uh, the differences between the magnocellular and the parvicellular, okay? The two types of neurons are key to the hypothalamic endocrine functions, okay? So let's start off with magnocellular. Okay, the cells are going to be much larger. They're predominantly located in the parvi, ventricular, and superoptic nuclei. These are the ones that are going to produce the neuropeptides, oxytocin and arginine vasopressin. Now, they throw in that specific amino acid in vasopressin, but you can also just simplify it um, ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Okay. When you get the pressin, vasopressin effects, in other words, the effects that would enhance blood pressure, etc., that's usually with a greater amount of vasopressin or ADH in the blood at the time. It's interesting to note also that what you see from the axons that lead these particular cells, that are unmyelinated. They're going to be forming this uh, hypothalamal hypophyseal tract, and they're going to terminate in the posterior pituitary. Now, with parvicellular cells, they're much, much smaller in size. They have projections that terminate in the median eminence. They will have also those that uh, reach out to the brain stem and spinal cord. They release small amounts of releasing or inhibiting hormones that control anterior pituitary function. This is something you want to keep in mind that um, we talk about releasing hormones a lot, RH. But what we don't always mention is that there are several hormones that act in an inhibitory fashion. I'll get into that in a minute or two. What you have to keep in mind is that these are the hormones that are going to be transmitted uh, or transported because they're going to be secreted into the first part of the portal uh, capillary bed, travel down these long veins, and then be released from the secondary capillary bed that's present in the anterior pituitary. 
So what hormones are you going to be seeing uh, released? Uh, corticotropin releasing hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone. That's what the full names are of these different letter combinations. Now, some places will use luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone, but really you get GnRH, which is gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone. GHRH is different. That's growth hormone releasing hormone. Then we have somatostatin. Now, interestingly enough, somatostatin is one of those inhibitory hormones. Okay. Second one is dopamine. Dopamine can be released, and it will usually have an inhibitory effect on PRH. Hence, it's also been referred to as PIH, dopamine, which stands for uh, uh, prolactin inhibiting hormone. PRH is prolactin releasing hormone. Okay. Now, all of these releases are going to be occurring because what these releasing factors do is they trigger the pituitary cells to secrete those other hormones, which we'll get into, okay? Now, it's very important to understand that what is released from the hypothalamus has a particular target. There are different types of pituitary cells. They will release different uh, materials, or different, I should say, hormones. So this is a little bit of a taste of getting used to the um, anterior pituitary target, but I want you to be familiarized with this. And what does this do? So gonadotropin-releasing hormone, that's going to act on the pituitary to cause the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now, corticotropin-releasing hormone CRH acts to cause the pituitary to release ACTH. Now, there's a heads up here. You see right afterwards, it's beta lipotropin hormone. Okay. There is a, a bit of a controversy that was also referred to as melanocyte stimulating hormone. Um, depending on what book you're reading, there is some controversy about whether LPH is really the precursor to break down melanocyte stimulating hormone. And I'll explain that a little bit longer for a second. Melanocyte stimulating hormone does this. And yes, you can see that lower down there, MSH. It stimulates um, the melanocytes, that is the pigmentation cells in the skin, etc., to release more melanin, granules of melanin. Now, this can be for a variety of reasons, but it is uh, quite present. Um, beta lipotropin uh, hormone is still kind of, nobody's isolated the receptor, which is part of the problem. It is thought to have acted on uh, the release of adipocytes and basically to release free fatty acids. But there's, it's the, the signs are not really clear there, okay? So I'm going to leave that sort of left hanging. Definitely no ACTH, okay? Thyrotropin-releasing hormone, TRH. That, by the way, is an interesting one because it is only constructed of, are you ready? Three amino acids. TRH will act on the pituitary target to cause the release of TSH. Okay. Now, what about GHRH? Well, growth hormone releasing hormone acts on a particular type of cell called the somatotrophs. And it causes the release of growth hormone. But look right below it. GH inhibiting hormone, that also goes by the name somatostatin. It also goes by the name GHIH, growth hormone inhibiting uh, hormone. Now what somatostatin does is it acts on the somatotropes. These are a type of cell in the pituitary 
and it blocks or inhibits the release of growth hormone. Okay. Now, prolactin releasing hormone, that is supposed to work on um, basically the lactotrophs for the release of prolactin. There is some questionability about that, but we'll continue. Prolactin inhibiting hormone, this is an interesting one. It's really dopamine. And what this does is it acts on the uh, lactotrophs uh, to release prolactin, okay? Now, melanotropin-releasing hormone, MRH, that acts to release melanocyte-stimulating hormone. As I mentioned to you before, MSH acts on cells that produce um, and these melanin granules for example give us the different hues in the skin etc now there is an opposite to that melanotropin inhibiting hormone mih and mih will work on melanocyte stimulating hormone but it will basically inhibit its release now this is another diagram. You know, you can only get certain diagrams and you have to do a little editing or make it clearer. So let's go through this. As you can see in the first one, two, three, going from a left to right, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, neurons. Okay. At the top in the, th in the hypothalamus. So what do we got? GnRH acts in a positive way to have the anterior pituitary release uh, FSH and LH, the, the eventually the target organs, of course, the gonads, testes and ovaries. CRH will act to cause the anterior pituitary to release ACTH. ACTH acts on the adrenal cortex to release cortisol, okay, hydroxycortisone. TRH. Now, in every place where you see pluses, that's that has that's having a positive influence, okay? A secretory influence. This works on the anterior pituitary. TRH causes TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone, and then it works on the thyroid. Of course, it's going to produce T3, T4. Then we get into the double situation there. PRH, which is prolactin releasing a hormone. In a positive way, works on lactotrophs, which are cells, a type of cell in the anterior pituitary, and that causes prolactin to be released, which acts on the mammary gland. Now, dopamine, which is also known as PIH, that acts to inhibit the lactotrophs from uh, releasing prolactin. Okay? Finally, we get growth hormone. GHRH, that acts in a positive means to stimulate the uh, cells in the anterior pituitary to release growth, inhibits the release of GH. Now, with all of that done, we need to just keep mindful of the neurosecretory cells, which I wanted to include this again. This is why it gets to be sort of a confusing mishmash, and I wanted to deal with. Um, the posterior, which will be next week, and then the anterior the week after, because you start talking about target cells and what they do, etc. Let's talk about this for a second. So now we have these cells that are up in the hypothalamus with these unmyelinated axons that basically terminate in the posterior pituitary, and one set will cause ADH, and its primary target is the kidney. The other target... Um, the other hormone, and its target is the mammary gland, although it does act in situations of pregnancy to cause um, the uh, uterine myometrium to go through incredible uh, contractions to eventually expel the uh, child during childbirth. And you can see how they do this, and it looks very interesting because it looks like almost a crossing over here of the pathways. All right. Now, I've talked a little bit about the 
uh, hypothalamic portal system, I just want to talk a little bit more about this for a minute. This is a system of blood vessels. It is one of only two real known portal systems that exist. The other one is in the liver. And this is a microcirculation that occurs at the base of the brain. It connects the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Remember, the anterior pituitary is more glandular. So it has a different embryonic development than, let's say, the posterior pituitary. Now, the basic importance to this portal system is you can quickly transport and exchange hormones and keep in mind that the hormones are extremely low concentrations but the distance is so uh, small that you're really not going to lose um, the strength or the signal because there's really not a lot of places to dilute the uh, hormone being released okay now, this is going to be located between the hypothalamus's arcuate nucleus and the anterior pituitary gland. And the other nice thing about this is that you see this microvascular structure indicates that you can have a control moment to moment in the streams of information, i.e. the hormonal secretions, between the lobes of the pituitary gland. Okay? Now, one other little thing. Question, question, question. How do they get through the, the capillary walls? In other words, how does the hypothalamic hormones get in? How do the hypothalamic hormones, when they get down to the anterior pituitary, get out? This is because the capillaries are fenestrated. Now, if you ever look up or ever had uh, A and P, you know that fenestration, they have very small channels with high vascular permeability. Okay, so there's little pockets, there's little areas, and this is going to allow for a rapid exchange between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It's one thing to have the blood uh, supply going from hypothalamus to pituitary, but then the other thing is you've got to have rapid pickup from the interstitial space of the hypothalamus and then you have to have it picked up into the blood to be dumped right out into the pituitary. Okay? And here you have it. Here is the initial area. Uh, that's the primary um, capillary bed. Okay? Here you have the superoptic nuclei, and you have some of the other cells are going to synapse down onto uh, the capillaries, and then they're going to travel down here. And then you've got the secondary capillary bed here, which is going to release. Now, when they say pars distalis, pars nervosa, that's another way of saying anterior pituitary, anterior, uh, excuse me, posterior pituitary. The posterior, as I said to you before, is more neuronal, so they call it pars nervosa. And this is more glandular, so they call it par distalis. Okay? All right. And you can see where the median eminence is right here, sort of this funnel structure to the infundibular stem. Now, what are some of the triggers that cause... There's a variety of them. And I'm giving you also a heads up. I'm bringing in another hormone here, melatonin. Hang in there for a minute. A lot of times you're going to have afferent signals that convey sensory information about the patient's environment. And that can trigger select hypothalamic secretion. Okay. Light is one trigger that helps with circadian rhythmicity for hormonal secretion. I was very fortunate. I had uh, one of the world-renowned chronobiologist John D. Palmer in the mid-80s as a, I had a course and, and it was incredible to, to find out that there's all sorts of different biological clocks from the secretion of sodium and potassium to the uh, basically, by the way, when I say secretion, I mean really excretion. It was how there was a rhythm of the excretion that occurs to uh, body temperature rhythms, 
to basically the uh, levels of certain types of hormones that are in the body. So nothing is purely turn on, turn off. It happens in sort of pulses and it may happen in part timed by certain external stimuli or certain uh, other biological stimuli. Let's talk light for a few minutes. Light, really, you have a pathway that's a little bit convoluted, but it makes a lot of sense. The pathway is light is going to, of course, involve the retina. Then, of course, you've got the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then you have also the pineal gland. Now, this is besides the pathway that goes from optic nerve to optic chiasm to the thalamus and then to the radiations of nerve pathways to eventually going into and being processed by the occipital gland, excuse me, occipital lobe. Here's an interesting point we're going to get into that the pineal gland really secretes melatonin. Now, melatonin is a modified amino acid. It's synthesized from tryptophan. So the, the process uh, goes with enzymatic uh, alteration. You have tryptophan converted to serotonin, converted to melatonin. At night, melatonin is uh, circadian rhythmicity because really, if you were just without any light, you would have a biological clock that would be about 24.6 to 25 hours, which means that as time went on, you would be shifting one hour almost of getting up. And they've done these studies with people in caves and in, uh, you know, prepared for spacecraft flight and all this other stuff. What happens if they don't get the uh, necessary light? Well, this, that, the other thing. The problem is, in the 90s, people started attributing melatonin to not just something that would help you maybe get used to or overcome jet lag because you crossed so many time zones, or maybe get uh, a little bit more sleep. But they started doing all sorts of stuff, increase uh, sex drive, increase fight off diseases and all this stuff. And that was a lot of nutritional quackery. But when we talk about timing of all of these uh, hormones, uh, you have to have some sort of stimuli that allows for this timing. Now, this is a much larger map that you'll probably be coming back to eventually. But you can see all the different hypothalamic hormones going down the portal, capillary vasculature, down into these and controlling the uh, secretion of these other stimulating hormones or directly of these hormones, in this case, PRL going right to the mammary gland. And this is important, but this is equally important. Take a look at where the hypothalamus is in the brain, the thalamus, and right on the tip, there's that pineal gland, that little teeny weeny little spud there. Now, Here's the molecule of melatonin, okay? And what happens is, because of the in, input, the neural input here from um, the structures that detect the presence of light, you start having um, certain secretion at a time, which basically it rises, melatonin rises during the night. Some people take some. To help them to sleep. Sometimes it works, for others it doesn't. Little sidebar here. As we age, until the time of, you know, CAT scans and MRIs, we were only relying on x-rays to detect and understand the skull and the brain and everything else. But the interesting thing is, you see what happens in the pineal gland and the cells are very similar to retinal cells, okay? But they start to be replaced by these calcium, uh, the best way to put it is calcium secretions. And it's eventually called brain sand. And doctors, when they were looking at uh, x-rays in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they would be able to navigate out where 
the person's brain in relationship to the pineal gland was by basically uh, being able to detect the brain sand, the accumulations of this. Now, whether brain sand, there is a relationship between brain sand and the decrease of the natural uh, endogenous melatonin secretion, there's not really any, I've never seen any really hard data on this, okay? Melatonin levels do alter uh, upon the onset of puberty, and that may play a role in turning over and firing up uh, some of the gonadotropin-type hormones as well. But this is just a small tip of the iceberg when it comes to the pineal gland. Here is the melatonin biosynthesis. Now, to save you from sleep, because I always get, you know, how, how, how detailed is he going to ask questions? Okay, here's what's going to happen. I want you to understand what the presence of foliate allows you to have 5-hydroxytryptophan with the presence of vitamin B6 and the dopa decarboxylase you can convert this into serotonin, okay? But I'm not asking you to memorize the enzymes as much as I am telling you, you really should know the steps and what is made and where it comes from. Um, in part, you're going to see melatonin being something that's um, kind of like a supplement, unless the regulatory agencies jump in or unless there's evidence of it being uh, extremely abused. Okay, let's move onward. So what are some of the other triggers? Oh, wait a minute. Before I go, I wanted to just bring up one point. Let's just go back here for one second. Okay, you've been telling me about light. What about blind people? What about blind people? In other words, if blind people... Let's say they can't get the light through the eyes to the back of the retinas and then there get processed. What happens? With some individuals where they do not get any light, maybe it's because of cataracts, maybe it's because of eye damage or whatever. It's interesting. They start going into this circadian um, shift that they will experience. I mentioned to you before. And for them to get realigned, um, they're now taking certain uh, drugs that will help them, okay? Uh, there are other individuals that have what they call seasonal affective disorder. So what they try to do is use ex extensive lights or their certain medication, or sometimes they'll mix it with melatonin. Uh, melatonin has been used also with individuals who go through profound jet lag, in other words, jump like 12 time zones. Because what you have to think about is this. Let's say I leave Boston Airport. It's 9 a.m. I go to a place. Uh, let's say I decide to go to uh, what's, what's really interesting. I'm going to go to Tokyo. And I go to Tokyo, and there are a, uh, still night. You know, and what happens is your body is still at nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. And this can cause problems because you're supposed to sleep when you're awake or you're supposed to uh, take and, you know, go to sleep and you arrive at a place that's in the middle of the day and that can upset the various biological rhythms that exist in the body uh, for quite some time. As a matter of fact, the realignment of the sodium and potassium excretion rhythms doesn't get settled till you're back about 10 days after you're back into your normal time zone. Okay? So anyways, let's move on. Okay. Now, there are other triggers on the hypothalamus that can cause um, some changes. And that's dependent upon what types of cells that exist in the hypothalamus. So let's take a few uh, examples. 
First, glucose sensing neurons. These are located in the lateral, arcuate, and ventral medial hypothalamic regions. Now, due to glucose fluxes during the day, uh, this helps us monitor body energy states and basically by triggering changes in hormonal release, in altering our metabolic rate, and in food intake. The next one is even more interesting. It's osmoreceptors. These detect small changes in fluid osmolality and help maintain osmotic pressure of the extracellular fluid. And basically what you're doing is you're maintaining the equilibrium between the water intake, which we can uh, determine as thirst, versus diuresis, which would be excretion. Now, this is very important because sometimes you will have these grave shifts that occur, such as in hemorrhaging, okay, or in profound dehydration. Now, hormones can result in inhibition or increase in cell activity, but they can also modulate the cell activity. Think about it this way. It's not as much as I've said before, an on-off switch. It's a volume dial. And basically, that is how you're going to have adjustments for homeostasis. When you do some case studies, you'll find that, okay, this is the immediate compensatory actions done by the by the endocrine system to help during a crisis but they do uh, modulate themselves down once let's say the crisis is over whether that's an asthma attack whether that's extreme hemorrhaging uh etc <clears throat> excuse me now hormonal control is not just control of the secretion but it's control of cellular synthesis of select hormones okay cortisol is going to affect crh uh, which controls the synthesis of this big molecule i've mentioned it once before palm c pro opio melanocortican uh, which is the precursor for acth if you stop the synthesis of palm c all of those hormones that would have been clipped off from that big, long peptide string called POMC, you're going to slow that down or stop it. Okay? Finally, you have to keep in mind that hormone release is controlled by negative feedback, which we've, week one, we went through that. Uh, we've got uh, negative feedback in many different places. For example, ACTH is going to be able to feed back to CRH. And so once you do ACTH release, it will eventually feed back and uh, decrease the secretion of CRH. We also have had, of course, the case of positive feedback with oxytocin and it having its effect on uh, contraction of uh, the myo, uh, myometrium, the muscular part of the uterine muscle uh, during childbirth. Okay. So here we have the situation, the hypothalamus, you have releasing hormones, they turn on uh, the anterior pituitary secretions for its systemic uh, target organs. You have also some inhibiting hormones that will turn off the anterior pituitary secretion. We've talked about this. If negative VE seems a little bit confusing, plus VE, it's a shorthand for saying positive or negative effect. So if you take a look, here's T4. T4 will have a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary, blocking TSH secretion, as well as on the hypothalamus, blocking TRH. Okay? And by the way, the stresses don't have to be uh, something nutritional. They can be some of the other factors, such as external uh, changes, such as stress or cold. Okay? we produce more thyroid hormones in response to very cold environments. Okay. All right. Let's see. Oh, yeah. We got to consider this. If you take a look at this chart, what have you got? You've got just a basic, simple uh, HPA axis, and uh, the hormones can have inhibitory effects as well as the trophic hormone that is released from the anterior pituitary. Enough said there. Now, 
disruption of hypothalamic hormone release examples. Uh, for example, you have the problem with patients that are in 24 hours in an ICU. Okay. You have all that constant lighting and it disturbs the light, dark melanin release. And sub subsequently, it can destabilize circadian rhythms. It's a stressor in essence. Travel across time zones, jet lag. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Travel across a bunch of different time zones. What are you gonna have? You're gonna have a feeling of yuckiness. I mean, some people talk about it this way, others do this, others do that. I would say that you also see a little bit of this if you go up to places like uh, above the Arctic or below the Antarctic circles. And what I mean by that is what you're facing in some cases, think about it, is three to six months of perpetual darkness, depending on where the planet is. Uh, is shifted itself during the seasons. The other situation that will occur is, of course, night shift employment. Now, night shift employment, some places get their people oriented into the shift and they stay there. The worst examples I've ever heard of night shift employment destabilizing individuals was this uh, mining company and they were out and I think it was Utah or Nevada, but they shifted everybody once a week. So one week you were on first shift, next week you were on third, uh, second shift, next week you were on third shift, and then you're back to first shift. And they had an extremely high amount of accidents. And once they had a specialist come in and they were able to uh, sort of like an industrial psychologist and looked at all this and went, oh my gosh. And the company did not want to follow through with this. But if you kept somebody on for about a month, you noticed, uh, kept them on a month for basically that particular shift, you noticed a decrease in the accident rate. Now you have to think about this. You're under extreme stress, so you're going to have much higher cortisol rates and you do tend to have a hard time with some extremely important uh, thought processing, etc. That said, what about also other disruptions? Neurological disease, for example, Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes the patients will not sleep on normal times, and that's disturbing. And then in general, aging. Sometimes aging will have an effect that it will alter the release of certain hormones, etc. What about the treatment for circadian rhythm disorders? Well, there are a variety of them out there. Uh, the benzodiazepines are uh, ones like uh, Xanax. Um, Modonafil and Provigil, as its uh, commercial name, that basically is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. This is the type that they give to pilots that are going on long range bombing missions. In other words, if they leave from uh, Nellis Air Force Base on a, a B-1 or a B-2 and they were going to go bomb, let's say, uh, Afghanistan or something, they're going to be in a 36 hour straight flight. There's no nap time for those pilots. There's not a lot of room in those cockpits also. So they take these pills and they're awake and alert, et cetera, for the entire flight. Okay. Nobody wants to have somebody go, oops, and crash, you know, especially for a multi, a multi million dollar craft. I mentioned to you melatonin. There are some non benzodiazepine hypnotics. Um, sometimes you have people in the upper northern uh, latitudes. I got it right. And basically, they tend to have emotional problems more often when they get less and less light. And so this is usually depression and things like that. And it may suggest some neurological, sometimes even hypothalamic effects. And so what they do is they basically every day read or in front of them have a certain light panel with sufficient spectrum 
that will help them to maintain their hormonal levels and their emotional levels. Now, what about treatment for non-24-hour sleep wake disorder? As I mentioned to you, usually you'll see this with blind individuals, also with dementia patients. So they include tazimilatalon, otherwise known as uh, hetalos, which is a melatonin receptor agonist. In other words, this is a drug that acts on melatonin at, um, receptors. It acts similar to uh, melatonin, but it has a much better uh, efficacy and a longer lifespan. So therefore, the patient is able to deal with this and uh, not deal with some of the circadian lags that occur. And if you want to see a lot of other interesting drugs that play a role in either assisting or synthesizing, uh, you can see the agonists and the antagonists here, okay? And I think it's interesting because what happens is there are those drugs that block the effects of hypothalamic or pituitary hormones. We'll probably get into more of those when we start talking about, uh, for example, the posterior pituitary. And then we're going to be talking about the anterior pituitary. But if you notice here, here's one, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone. You can also have an agonist action by gonorrhillin, or you can have also uh, both the agonist, which will bind to the GnRH receptor here, uh, leprovide, and then you also have the antagonist to that GnRH, and that is Ganarelix. And these basically will act as an antagonist, so in other words, you would expect that it would be a decrease in the response to GnRH or to this drug. And to have a substitute, let's say, for GnRH for the agonist here. Okay? Now, that said, we'll have a case study this week. There is going to be a change here. It's not going to be Friday of each week. It's going to be Thursday at 4 p.m. And I will update this shortly. Please understand that there is a reason why that I'm changing these. First off, if we're going to have our case studies, I would like to have everybody pretty much take time to read, review the videos, as well as fill out the case studies and submit it. Have a copy present with you when we go over the case study so you can add where you might have missed on something. I'm not taking any late work after this, uh, as of this week. Now, documents on the grades, uh, documents will be graded basically on completeness, accuracy, and correctness. Keep in mind that all case studies will be reviewed um, on Saturday. So if your case study is incorrect, you want to basically uh, add the details. No, let me clarify that. We're going to be reviewing all the case studies on Thursday. We'll try 5 p.m., and if I can, I'm going to push it back to 4. And I've got some things I'm trying to work out on that. But what I want you to do primarily besides submitting the case study is take and use it as a tool to assist you in reviewing the content. Okay? And also, when we get into areas where case study means that you have to review uh, and determine whether certain vital signs of the data in the examples of the case study are important, I put into the Blackboard just to remind you that there's information there and in the appendix of your book for the determination of case study uh, diagnosis. Well, have a good week. Next chapter, the posterior pituitary gland.